we continue with the second video in our unit one of equity valuation and uh, now we're going to extend our discussion beyond the introduction part to looking at what are the various methods of uh, evaluating stocks so we're going to kind of move towards how do we do valuation and what are the types of valuations that are available and because we're going to focus purely on uh, the fundamental valuation bit of it let's try and understand what are the various methods of doing fundamental valuation right now when you're doing fundamental analysis you're trying to find what is the intrinsic value of a company and there are broadly three methods that could be used the first one is something which basically tries to identify what is the return that you're going to generate out of a particular stock which is nothing but what is it that you're going to get in terms of future cash flow streams and you try and find the present value of that something similar to the net present value approach we will discuss about this in a little bit more detail but possibly something on these lines is what uh, what we're trying to do is uh, is what is called as intrinsic value and because you're trying to discount the future cash flow stream this is known as discounted cash flow methods right dcf standing for discounted cash flow methods the second method you could use in terms of trying to identify a security and uh, find the value of that is something called as relative valuation now here you're comparing the stock's valuation to similar entities in the market right financial ratios of the company being valued are compared with similar firms in the market and you're trying to base your judgment on what is someone else paying for a similar company if you're trying to value a hospital your first estimate is to try and find out did someone else pay some amount for a hospital and how was it paid and what was the objective in that payment that how did they arrive at a certain value in that hospital's value right that's what is called as relative valuation and the third one is either other methods or what are called as contingent methods right now what are contingent methods these are typically probability based valuations of specific companies now these use techniques such as real option valuation which are uh, advanced techniques in cases where you're not certain that the cash flow is going to materialize right so you are trying to ascribe a certain probability of that success take for example a company that does drug discovery and research a pharma company a pharmaceutical company that does drug discovery and research you're not sure whether the molecule that they're trying to find out or the or the medicine that they're trying to make will they succeed in, in it or not right so in those cases you estimate a certain probability on the on the company's success and come up with that there are some other methods which are used which is basically try and find out what is the value of the asset which is if you were to sell the assets of the company uh, in the market what is the value that you will derive out of it and things like residual income valuation which is after paying the stakeholders what is left with the company right and what is the value of that income right we're going to look at some of these in more detail as we go along but primarily in this section we're going to talk about the intrinsic value that's an introduction to the intrinsic value concept and we're going to try and understand what are the positives and negatives of this approach before in the next units we'd go and dive deeper into each of these segments right so the the in-depth analysis of these areas we're going to do later but let's introduce ourselves to the intrinsic value concept right before we reach the intrinsic value concept let us recap our discussions on net present value so how did we find net present value for a project or uh, or any company or any series of cash flows so the first idea is to actually find out what the cash flows are let's say there are three cash flows that a particular instrument is giving us right in year one two and three the next idea was to find out the present value of each of these to find out the present value we have what is called as the expected return from the stream of cash flows let's name that r right so how do i find the present value each cash flow 
gets discounted by the rate R and we basically are trying to do that for the number of years where the cash flow is expected and the net present value of this series is nothing but the summation of all these what I have done is I've taken time zero and moved all these cash flows to time zero I'm sure we remember this analysis in terms of how do we identify the net present value of something right now logically speaking let's simplify the argument if you are going to get after one year rupees 100 from a bank right or let's let's call this 110 from a bank and your expected return is 10 percent the price you should be willing to pay for this today is 100 rupees right you should be willing to pay 100 rupees for this if you're expecting another instrument that gives you 121 at the end of two years and nothing till then and your expected return is still 10 percent the price should be 100 100 into 1 plus 10 percent raised to the power 2 should give you 121 correct that makes sense so this is the recap of our NPV analysis that we have done what we are trying to do is we are trying to identify a cash flow stream and we are trying to arrive at what is the correct price that I pay now if I want a return of 10% if I want a return of 10% I cannot pay greater than 100 correct if I pay anything greater than 100 let's say I pay 102 then my return is 110 so this R is going to be smaller than 10% it's probably going to be 8% right and so given a certain expectation of return I can arrive at what I think is the fair value for this particular stock right what I think is the fair value for this particular bond or stock or instrument about which we are talking that is the context of intrinsic value it's a straight extension of the NPV concept just that there are a few nuances that get played out when you're valuing equities when you're valuing equities in real life there are a few important nuances that come into play that's the structure of a DCF or intrinsic value which is discounted cash flows valuation you have a series of cash flows till n years and you have an expected rate of return which is also called as weighted average cost of capital or depending on what the cash flow is it could be a, a cost of capital or cost of equity but that's the expected rate of return from this series of cash flows right however in real life when you are evaluating a stock there could be a difference in terms of what kind of uh, what kind of uh, uh, issues we encounter in doing a simple NPV analysis a simple NPV analysis has finite cash flows which means it is three years or five years or seven years companies have infinite cash flows right you expect companies to exist till infinity so companies have infinite cash flows in the case of bonds or simple cash flows expected return is easy to calculate that's not so easy to calculate in the case of companies right and so infinite cash flows this and finally cash flows themselves are uncertain and because cash flows are uncertain the expected returns depend on what is the degree of uncertainty of the cash flow higher uncertainty would mean higher risk which would mean that your expected rate of return would be higher but in general any discounted cash flow valuation would take this particular structure right now what what do I need as inputs I need the cash flows I need R and I need a value beyond these n years of projection what happens in future till infinity that's what is the value that I'm going to derive right so these are the three inputs that I will require require so infinity value till infinity right 
when I'm doing a DCF valuation. Now, what are we trying to do? There are three aspects to this. What to value? So we have to try and find out the cash flows. Finding out the cash flows will need a business understanding. I cannot find out the cash flows for a company like Infosys till the time I understand what is their business. So what are their business drivers which help me do projections on both revenues and costs, right? That's what I have to do in my discounted cash flow activity or valuation, right? The second thing is what is the expected return? So how do we find out the discount rate? Some part of this discussion we've already kind of done in our earlier sections or earlier courses, right? So we know how to calculate weighted average cost of capital. We know how to calculate cost of equity using what is called as the CAPM model, right? So we know this, we will recap this at some point of time, but basically what is my expected rate of return from a particular company? We do have estimates on how do we find that out, mechanisms on how do we find that out, methods on how do we find that out, right? What happens after the explicit period, right? So I have cash flows for an explicit period. What is the explicit period? This is the period till where I can forecast, right? So three years, five years, seven years, whatever. What is the thing that happens after this explicit period? Now the method that typically gets used is after this explicit period, after our projection period, we basically use a stable growth assumption. We assume that the company is now getting towards steady state growth and it will grow at a certain rate and not beyond that rate, right? That's our assumption about explicit period. What happens after explicit period? We could also use some other mechanisms of trying to find out the value of the company after the explicit period. We will look at those also in more detail as we go along, right? In terms of our first argument as to what are the cash flows that we are looking at, what are the different types of cash flows that exist for any investor when looking at a company? Right? So we could look at what is called as dividends. If you are a stock investor, your first set of cash flows that come to you are the dividends. Right? Now, if a company gives dividends, lots of dividends, then you can just straight away value the dividends because this is the real cash flow in the hands of an investor. But if the company does not pay dividend, then you move to some other methods which are known as free cash flow to equity free cash flow to firm these are when not enough dividend is being paid right so if the company is in growth phase or for whatever reason is paying lesser dividend then you look at these methods and in the case of free cash flow to equity you discount the cash flow to equity holders only the equity holders and in the case of TCF using free cash flow to firm FCFF, you look at all stakeholders, which includes the guys who have given you the debt, right? So those are the different kinds of cash flows. It's simple to understand that in the case of equity, we're going to use a variant of net profit, which is the cash flow to the equity holder. In the case of free cash flow to firm, we are going to use a variant of EBIT, which is a cash flow to both the equity and the debt uh, holders, right? So those are the discounted cash flows that we uh, that we find and we'll use and we'll try and understand and identify them and look at examples of a variety of companies when we look at this data, right? Now, what are the key benefits of DCF when you're doing something like a DCF? Because you have to make projections using discounted cash flows, it forces us to understand the business and make projections of future cash flows. Now, I can't make sensible projections of future cash flows unless I am really forced to think about what are the key drivers of this business. It is an absolute measure of value. So I do not need anything else. I just need a company and its financials and my ability to be able to project those financials. If I can do that, I will be able to find out what is uh, the value of the company. So it's not a relative measure. 
it's an absolute measure i can independently value a company right i can independently value a company so it forces us to understand the business because without understanding the business i will not be able to project how does the company make money and what amount of money will it be able to make next year and it helps me to independently value a company regardless of what the market thinks about valuation of other companies or other aspects right it can also be used in the reverse which is let's say i do a dcf and i arrive at some sort of an estimate of the net present value of cash flows uh, but this is different from my estimate of the of the value and the market is different market gives a value of let's say 1000 and i'm getting a value of 700 using some inputs now what happens is i can obviously try and change these inputs to arrive at the price of 1000 it then tells me what kind of assumptions the stock market is making to arrive at a price of 1000 right will it be selling more will the costs be lower will the growth be higher will uh, risk go down what is it that the stock market assumes that results in this price that is different from what we estimated are those assumptions logical or feasible right so what it does is one it forces us to understand the business two it is an absolute measure which can allow us to independently value a company three even if i'm not getting what is the price in the market if i try to reach the price in the market i will have to change my inputs when i change my inputs after changing my inputs i can make a question whether those changes are feasible you know to arrive at 1000 rupees of price if i get 50 percent growth estimate and if that is not feasible then that gives me an input that the stock could be incorrectly valued by the market right and maybe the stock should trade at a lower value than what the market is valuing it at that is the key benefit of dcf in terms of discounted cash flow these are the three major benefits that come out it's not like there are no issues there are some negatives or issues as well now what are the issues the projections of discounted cash flows involve a lot of estimates how do i know what is going to be the dividend next year how do i know what is going to be the profit next year and because they will involve a lot of estimates and my understanding of the business it increases the chances of errors right so estimates have to be made on what is the next year revenue what is the next year cost what is the debt the company will have next year and so on and so forth right it is difficult to approach for young companies since the process assumes stable growth after some time so after the forecast period right after forecast period it assumes a stable growth but it is it's not impossible it's just difficult to approach it for young companies uh, because forecast becomes difficult forecasting is difficult you know beyond four or five years beyond four to five years you will find that if you were to project the revenues of a company in year 2030 it is very difficult to do so i mean how would you base your judgment on it also since it is an absolute valuation analysts tend to be either conservative on too many parameters or aggressive on too many parameters this is a problem that we will understand or appreciate better once we have approached relative or discounted cash flow valuation for a given company once we build a model on a company and do this uh, do this uh, valuation we will realize that we either tend to be so there are maybe 20 input parameters right to a model to a financial model that is valuing a company we either tend to be ultra conservative on most of them or aggressive on most of them which results in some form of double counting of either growth or slowdown right we have to be careful with this while doing valuation and that's that's one of the things that comes by looking at dcf we will obviously look at discounted cash flow valuations in much more detail in subsequent units at this point of time we end this particular introductory uh, section on discounted cash flow valuations with a couple of questions what are the key benefits of dcf valuations and what are the kinds of cash flows that can be used for valuing companies or valuations while using discounted cash flows? Thank you.